Hello, it's Scott Manley here with part 10 of Galileo Conquest, and we have a couple of new crew here. We have Jilfia and Halion. Yes, Valentina now has a posse. And so begins Operation Austin. On my mark. Mark! Oh, yeah. Whew, hope nobody noticed that I needed to check my staging there. Oh, apparently somebody did. It's like you can't sneak anything past that caption maker type person. Anyway, yeah, this is the second of my two and a half meter class rockets. And this one is going to do a very important mission, which is performing an EVA around the moon. We accepted a contract for that. We figured we should probably actually do it before we forget. And to be honest, this is a kind of mission profile which I'm pretty used to. We're just going to fly out there, stop in orbit, and come back. And that's why we named the rocket after Austin Purcell, the most boring priest in the whole of Ireland, at least in the universe of Father Ted. I actually found it interesting that I did this the week before SpaceX made their announcement about their space tourists, and therefore the new space race. Actually, truth be told, it's just a, another addition to the many, many proposed missions to return to the moon. There's uh, Russia, there's Japan, China, Europe. They all have proposed plans at one time or another. Anyway, this rocket with this rather small upper stage almost gets into a proper circular orbit. If I had adjusted the Perry apps or the Apple apps correctly, I could have got into a circular orbit. As it is, it dips into the atmosphere five kilometers. And yeah, all I need is a small bit of thrust to put myself into a much more circular orbit. I mean, given the efficiency of the rockets in Kerbal Space Program, it's actually pretty easy to build a single stage to orbit by accident. And of course, from low orbit, we start heading out towards IOTA. Now, if you look at that, that's my life support status, and you'll see that I have seven days before my... Well, I have six days of supplies, and then I have seven days of comfort inside that spacecraft. So, I am going to take a much faster route out to IOTA than I normally would. You'll notice that the, uh, the orbit that I'm setting, the injection orbit, is actually an escape trajectory, because we need to get out there fast, and then in a couple of days so that we have a little bit of time and then we can send ourselves home. And this means that I'm really working rather aggressively to put myself into the correct intercept orbit here. This was terribly inefficient, but I did have tons of spare Delta V here, so it wasn't such a problem. In fact, this does have more than enough Delta V to perform a landing on IOTA, but uh, if I do that, they will probably die due to malnutrition or something. But that's all part of being an astronaut, or a, a lunar explorer. Speaking of exploration, the forefathers were apparently right. Iota is clearly a jawbreaker in the sky. And now Jelfia Kerman takes a, a step outside to perform that EVA. And of course, collect that science. Your eyes feast on behalf of your mouth at the up-close view of Iota. The details translate well into mission logs later on. And for that matter, they translate well into me saying things, which means I don't have to start to fill airtime with other stuff. So yeah, because I made this very aggressive journey to IOTA, I I'm arrive at over a kilometer per second, and so that's 750 meters per second of Delta V that I gotta bleed off during this approach. This thing isn't particularly high thrust. Yeah, landing with that would be a delicate maneuver, but it doesn't matter because we are just going into orbit here. So since we're going into orbit, that's more than what SpaceX is talking about. SpaceX is just going to fly around. But uh, let's get the science. You discern a sort of glaze effect on the surface below. It reminds you of juice that has begun to freeze solid. Yes, remember, you can only get one crew report uh, for being in orbit, but you can get EVA reports from every single biome. And as we slip into the Midlands, we get... The dark blotches representing the Midlands seem like the tastiest part, not necessarily of candy. You're tempted to have your vessel immediately descend to confirm this. 
So yeah, I can just do this sitting outside the capsule, collecting the data. Obviously, this is the updated version of Galileo Planet Pack compared to what I originally started with. So there's more science descriptions and stuff in the in the pack now. So yeah, in the last few days, a few people have asked me whatever happened to Deep Space Expedition Alpha. That is the space adventures company. Uh, they you know basically came up with a plan to send a couple of very rich space tourists around the far side of the moon. And as of right now, it just ap appears to be in, like, continual uh, coming soon. They did announce the price tag was, like, $150 million. So one can presume that SpaceX is costing roughly the same. But on the other hand, the Dragon capsule is probably a whole lot more roomy. Anyway, uh, what I'm doing here is I started in an equatorial orbit and then I realized that if I wanted all the biomes, I needed to go into a polar orbit. And just knowing that I had tons and tons of fuel available to me, I just performed this 90 degree plane change maneuver in full on brute force style. That's about 370 meters per second. You're in orbit basically and you have to slow that down to zero and then uh, accelerate up to 260, but you can combine the two maneuvers, and thanks to the magic of Pythagoras, all you do is you take the square root of both velocities that are perpendicular and, you know, add those, and bang, you know, you get, it's like a triangle, and it's easy, and it means that you don't have to perform two separate maneuvers. It's brilliant. It's science, I tell you. And judging by the faces of the crew, they are totally impressed by my very basic grasp of mathematics. It's also worth noting the, the new Galileo Planet Pack has renamed the poles to be the Droops of Iota. Anyway, after a couple of days in orbit, our crew is starting to get a little antsy, and so we tell them that they can indeed come home. Now, coming home from a polar orbit, ideally you want the normal vector of your orbit to basically point to towards the parent body or away from the parent body. If it's off a little, then it means that you're actually going radially in or out, and that can slow your return. But I had, uh, I didn't have to worry about that too much. Again, lots of delta V. That's the way to work. That's the way I roll. Yeah, and because I still have 700 meters per second of delta V left, uh, it's a good idea for me to actually burn towards the planet towards a uh, gale and try to make sure that I get there within a couple of days so you can see this white orbit that's kind of changing as the periaps goes up and down that of course is the is the post encounter orbit there right that's their trajectories mod that's trying to figure out how much drag I'm gonna suffer and you see that as my periaps gets higher it, it I skip around a couple of times that would be bad if I skipped off there, right? So it isn't really that I'm skipping off the atmosphere like a, a rock skipping off of water. No, this is literally just passing through the atmosphere at too high, too rarefied, and coming out the other side and going around for another orbit, which could be really bad given that I have limited life support here. And that's what they had to worry about in the Apollo missions, right? They did consider a technique called skip re-entry to uh, improve the thermal load of the heat shield. They didn't use it in the end, but they did have to they did have to be concerned about the possibility of going in too high and then having to go around one more orbit. And that would have most likely left the astronauts running uh, out of out of supplies and also would have left the capsule in completely the wrong place. These fine astronauts do not have to worry about that at all. We've already done the math. We've already checked their trajectory. But we still have no idea where they're actually going to land because being able to put my spacecraft down somewhere close to where I want to be, that would require a whole lot of effort, which, uh, you know, time, effort, effort, time. I'm just going to actually put it down in the planet and let whichever country finds it claim the space capsule as their own, as a prize. Look, I know we're dropping space debris on your territory, but you should consider it an honor. In fact, world leaders should keep checking their mail because very soon we are going to be sending out game cards for space debris bingo. 
Many exciting prizes to be won, including temporary tattoos, miniature models of spacecraft and of course, a journey around the moon. And when I say the moon, I mean it's obviously Iota, I'm not referring to a moon called the moon because that would be silly, why would you have something named after itself, like, wouldn't that be really confusing? Even worse, could you imagine taking the word moon and then changing it so it's pronounced the same but spelled differently? That would be so confusing! Much better to have a completely different name to avoid any possible confusion whatsoever. Anyhow, the good news is that this craft is back on Gale and of course uh, oh, Jelfia! Jelfia is going to be the one getting out to perform all the science and sciencing stuff. There! Oh! Yeah, there she is. Come on, collect that science. Get the surface sample. You find traces of silica in rock. Really? Silica in rock? My god! It's truly amazing what the boys down in the lab can do with a pile of dirt. I mean, those guys and girls down in R&D are truly amazing. They can look at a pile of dirt and use that to get inspiration about how to build more amazing rocket engines, right? I mean, dirt is feeding in directly into our rocket science. Yeah, 452, I guess we can unlock two of these. So precision propulsion gives me more rockets. More rockets are a nice way to go. And I'm going to go with hydroponics because we have a station in orbit and it would be nice to learn how to run uh, a life support system. However, I have a few weeks to uh, figure out how to get the, the crew back and forth there. So I thought Jebediah might start developing a new class of technology, a reusable space plane, oh yes. Why am I doing this when I had a rocket that could go into orbit almost? Uh, because Jebediah likes to try new things and because it's sometimes fun to build planes with the bits and pieces I have. And this thing kind of takes off. I think I really need to adjust. Whoa, there we go. That's it. This, uh, this is a prototype. This is the first time it's been flown. It has lots of air intakes. It has a pair of Panther engines there that will uh, basically push it up to regular kind of flight speeds and then of course it has a rocket capable of pushing itself into space. Now this is obviously just a development program, we know we can launch rockets, we are really good at rockets now, but planes, planes are always fun, part because they are dangerous. Uh, okay, we seem to be slowing down now, so I'll drop the nose a bit here. See if we can pick up more speed. 5,000 meters. Moving upwards, uh, about 20 meters per second. Now, I should point out right now, the only docking nodes I have are not nice and aerodynamic. So this thing isn't designed to dock, it's just designed to fly, or it's intended that some future version of this will just fly up next to it stop so the crew can EVA across. Right now, I don't think this is even going to get into orbit. I'm not even I'm sure it's going to get into space because getting into space is easy. You have to be really bad at Kerbal Space Program to never get into space. And it looks like we're losing speed, so start firing up that rocket engine. This is it! We're going to lift the nose up and we're going to push this up as high as possible. Apple apps 25 kilometers. 30 kilometers, starting to get very, very hot, 40 kilometers, 50, and really getting warm out there, 60, uh, 60 kilometers, almost there, almost there, don't run out of fuel just yet, 70, we are just going to get into space and we have a little bit of fuel left, actually, we have, we have enough, well, okay, we actually have spare fuel here, which probably means that I spent less, uh, I spent too little time in the atmosphere. There we go, we're going to get up and then I'm going to circularize this a bit. I'm not going to go up too high because I want to hit the atmosphere at a low angle. If you, if I boosted, continued boosting, I could have gone up to a much higher altitude. There we go, 1700 meters per second and 17, okay, that's us. That's us, we're out of oxidizer and now we're just going to fall back and hopefully 
find a nice place to land that isn't too wet because I just got this suit cleaned. Looks like there's a little island there. I'm not sure what that island is, whether it's a biome all of its own. So I'm trying my usual technique of uh, basically turning one direction to see if I can get any kind of, you know, turn there. Ooh. Here comes the heat! Let's hope this spacecraft remains in one piece. We're, we're kind of going down really fast here, but I guess the upside is that we weren't really that close to orbital velocity. Oh, 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 oh! And we pulled out of the dive. So now we turn over, and we still have a little bit of jet fuel so we can actually fly this thing around like an aircraft to pick our landing site. Listen to those engines burp and sputter as they get deprived of oxygen. When that happens, this really, really is a, a burpy, burpy, cheap sheep. Yeah, I think we have plenty of liquid fuel here, so what I'm really doing is I'm now adjusting my control surfaces to try and figure out the best way to fly this thing. It's kind of a big part of the test flights is the ability to adjust these things and then try to remember them so that they are applied back to the original as lessons, as permanent features. Of course, some aircraft, especially in Kerbal Space Program, they you really want to change their performance characteristics as velocity changes because it's quite common for something to be stable subsonic and then actually become terribly unstable when it goes supersonic. Or more likely, you'll find some critical speed causes the thing to want to oscillate up and down like a thing that oscillates up and down really, really quickly. I mean, these kind of PID-induced uh, oscillations in real life could be deadly. I mean, the famous case, I guess, is Jeffrey de Havilland, who was, you know, testing the speed of his aircraft and it started to oscillate wildly and his head basically smacked into the cockpit, broke his neck, and that was it. And one of the reasons we know this is because another pilot, the legendary Eric Winkle Brown, flew the same aircraft at the same speed and encountered the same vibrations, but because he was a lot shorter, he was able to, you know, hold it together, I guess. He didn't smack his head, didn't break his neck, and he recovered from it. And of course, you know, went on to be the test pilot that has more aircraft under his belt than anybody else. Sadly, he died last year. Anyway, uh, we are trying not to die here. We're trying to land very safely because that's what Jebediah Kerman does. You can see him looking out there, looking for his shadow. The shadow is... is somewhere down there. It must be 50 meters below us. Oh, watch the terrain here. We picked a place that is a little bit hilly. I can see that it's gonna go down. Let's get this on the ground. Quick, 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 but not too quick. Got it! And brakes, 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 brakes. And we landed in the highlands. Excellent! That's another biome for which I need uh, stuff. I need information. I need the data. Yeah, Jeb isn't much of a scientist, but uh, we'll we'll take what we can get from him. Do you have any wise words for this uh, flag marker here? Something to commemorate the history? Ah, oh, one day this will be history. Glad I'm still alive to see it. Of course, at this point, Jeb can't get back inside, so we need to just recover him as it is. We get a little bit more science, not a whole lot more, but that does bring us basically to the end of episode 10. We'll be back with more stuff next week. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.